Tom here from Stories Across Canada, and today I get to interview Shooter. Hi. Uh, so, Shooter, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, my name's Shooter Drover. I currently live in Chilliwack. I spent the last eight years in Kelowna, and prior to that, I grew up in Alberta. I guess my identity or what we'd be talking about mainly would be my transformation from homelessness and addiction into a stable member of society. So I guess, yeah. That's great. Yeah, I've known Shooter for a little bit, and uh, I think his story uh, is an important one for us to hear. So in the last year and a half, Shooter, uh, just give us a little picture of what life was like for you in the last year and a half. Uh, so I currently have 14 months of sobriety. So within the last year and a half, I went from homeless, alcoholic, meth head, coke head, kind of everything under the sun, to going into a faith-based treatment center, developing a relationship with Christ, and leaving that center and finding employment, and just a stability of my life that I didn't have prior to that ever, really. Yeah, so the last year and a half has been a total 180, and it's been good. Yeah, Shooter is, um, we connect a little while ago, like I said, uh, I know I know Shooter for a while now, and uh, he had left his treatment center, and he basically uh, needed to go uh, just to kind of, you know, do things for himself, and he uh, was living in a tent in a secret part of Chilliwack, I won't divulge yeah. where, and got a <laughs> job, and he uh, worked and got enough money and got a place where he still lives today and still works. And um, so, so tell us kind of this faith thing you mentioned, um, this kind of thing that happened last year and a half to you that was pretty important. I think the biggest part of it would be purpose and meaning. I was an atheist for most of my life and I struggled with, well, what's the point of this? What, what's the rhyme or the reason? I was a very nihilistic person and I didn't really care at the height of my addiction if I lived or I died or what harm I caused to people because I believed I was harmed and it was my right to be able to do whatever I wanted. I didn't care. I didn't see any positivity in humanity or an outlook that really had any hope. So I forget somewhere along my addiction, I heard a quote that changed my perspective and it was something along the lines of, I can always ask someone if they've been serious about their death or whatnot. And atheism, if you ask them, is your belief really to die and rot in the ground? And it really struck a chord with me because I thought, well, this is what I'm believing. And my life's horrible as it is. I better hope that there's something bigger out there. And I became open at that point to the aspect of God, or I'd call it intelligent creator. I didn't know where to start or where to begin. Luckily for me, I was living in a homeless shelter in West Kelowna, and I developed a relationship with one of the staff members there who was a former addict himself who went to recovery, and he kind of started speaking life into me and said, well, you're going to die, blah, 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 the story, I heard it a million times, but he kind of took an interest in me and allowed me to kind of sign a couple intake papers this and that I didn't really think much of it because I tried to get on the rehab waiting list where it's call do this for three four months and you, right. you never go anywhere with it and I was kind of like well and I didn't have the money to pay for any other treatment center so when I called the one and they said they could get me in in, in three or four days I kind of was well I'm living in a homeless shelter hating my life there's really nothing I'm going to lose. So I went there and I went there with an open mindset. And I guess that's where the faith started. And it's been good. Sober since. So you said something earlier, you said something about um, you really didn't care about your life or even other people like you just didn't care. And do you like looking back now, do you kind of where do you think that came from? Is there something in childhood or with life that you feel comfortable sharing? Like, Ah, I mean, like most addicts, we come from a house of addiction. Mine was alcohol. My family, that was our God. Yeah. Alcohol ruled our house and it's the only thing that mattered. And for me, alcohol is poison. I can't touch it. The shit, I black out every time I drink. Yeah. So for me, when I met, developed a relationship with alcohol at 15, I don't understand why I like it still to this day because I black out every time I touch it. So that for me, I think just, I was hurt. I felt 
worthless. I didn't understand my upbringing. I didn't understand how my loved ones could value that over, well, anything else. So I think there was a lot of hurt. And I think that led into me not caring. And then once again, with all the damage I caused, yeah. I continued to fuel that of not caring about anyone or anything. And you have siblings? Yeah, I have a younger brother and sister. And you're still in a relationship with them? Ah, yeah. It's not as rocky as it once was, but good, right? we're getting there. Yeah. And it's, uh, I think, yeah, I think it's interesting coming through uh, anything we go through. Like I think in this last year and a half, you know, people working through maybe not addiction, but working through anxiety and stress or losing jobs or loved ones. Like there's so many things that are, are trauma based. And, and I think how we, we learn to adapt through them. Sometimes we just, we're just coping. And I, I think, and, and I think with addiction, we're coping and we may not have the formation of our thoughts or words. Why? And childhood, and maybe it's not always a parent's fault, but just it's life. And then we, we reach a point where we find we have clarity and sometimes courage to take even the next step. And I remember you telling me of the fellow in West, the guy, uh, the worker that you met who suggested that you go to a recovery place. Yeah. And so, cause I remember when I met you, then that you told me that story. And I remember your eyes, like you were just going, man, I feel like this guy's not duping me. He was being genuine and real. Well, he struggled with meth addiction and I was, I went from cocaine into meth just due to the availability and the cheapness yeah. of it. So I, I think you can relate to someone who's been where you've been at. Yeah. And it worked for him. He was sober working at a homeless yeah. shelter. So I think that's why it resonated with me. But one thing I like to, is sometimes in addiction, you don't know any better. And I think that was a big thing for me is all I knew was alcohol and drugs. Right. Like I didn't, I never went to church. I never knew how to stay sober. I never knew how to function in a positive mindset. So when I went to treatment, it really was, I've been trying to get sober for like six years up to that point. And it was like, I was like a dry drunk when I was sober. I was biting my fingers, like every little thing, this, that. Like I could not stay sober for the life of me. So when I went somewhere where they kind of, there's rules, they put you in a place where there's no drugs, there's no alcohol. It gave me time to clear my head. And also it gave me something better. It gave me a tool, just kind of tools and tips to use. Because with it, I still have really bad days. I still want to use. I still want to get drunk. But I have something kind of to counteract it now. So yeah, you learn ways to cope. You learn a better way of living. Yeah, and I think, too, um, and we're not going to get into a lot of it, but I know with talking to Shooter, you know, the experience of where he found faith, uh, it wasn't this perfect it wasn't on a beach. I hated the place. I hate. Yeah. I hated every. I hated every single day I was there. <laughs> but I hated being homeless and a drug addict yeah. more. I, I hated the place. Yeah. And in this moment, so it wasn't like being on holidays on a sunset beach and somebody's no bringing it, you great food. It's, you're, you're desperate, desperate to change how broken you are, and you yeah. will go to any lengths to. And the thing is, when the longer you get sober, you start to realize like how broken and hurting you are. Like now I look at like the stuff I was okay with, like living, like I lived in ditches. I was homeless off and on. I had no money. I didn't eat food for days. I was in and out of the psych ward. I was arrested. This like, and you're okay with it. But once you get sober and the drugs clear and the fog clears and you see like, like holy crap, like that's not okay. And yeah, but you have to be desperate, I think, to put yourself through that because it's humbling having someone dictate what you do every hour of the day is a humbling experience but i was at a point where i was more desperate to have a new beginning and something new in life than to kind of run my own show like i did for the last 10 years i find interesting is that um again i've been involved or known a lot of people um that say have been in jail so they don't have control of their lives they you know get up eat then they have like these um, kind of disciplines or chores or whatever you call it. And there's something like they do their time, they get out and they're back in that thing. And so I don't believe like for me, I've always, whenever I could work, I'd work. I had discipline, this and that. I had a very good paying job at one point. That doesn't change a man. It's a heart change. And like, cause I find when you put some confinement on someone, what happens when you take the confinement away? And I saw this numerous times with myself getting clean and others. Anyone can pretend and put on a smile and say the right words. 
but when you take the confinement away, are they still doing the things to stay sober? And that was the biggest thing for me is like I developed a relationship with Christ. I given my life to Christ, but like when I left treatment, then it was the choice. Oh, are you going to actually join a church? Are you going to stay in your devotional life? Are you going to go into meetings? Are you still going to seek sobriety? And that's one thing I struggled with treatment as, in, I guess, jail. This Because anyone can act like a good boy in confinement. And I saw this time and time again in my life as I could say all the right words, but I didn't mean a single thing I said to you. Yeah. And I find like with addiction, there's a lot of manipulation. And I could say what... I could do and say and act like this, but I didn't mean it. So I kept on reverting back to my old ways. I think what happens, and if it's a faith-based experience or like, again, working through different components of trauma or, you know, j- just working through the hardships of life, uh, I think we have uh, these moments, uh, an aha moment or something happens where we, um, you know, all of a sudden we have some clarity. We have, uh, I was telling Shooter with me, uh, I've got some health issues and I'm working on um, getting control of my physical health back. And I've said that for 30 years. Yeah. And, uh, but you all of a sudden you have not just the knowledge, but then you have the willpower, the willpower motivation. Eyes. And so now, so this is, you know, last year and a half we've had, um, COVID, we've had, again, experiences, you've had like people going through a lot of things. So where, where you're at now, I know you have your own place and you're working and you go to church and you got some people around you that you like and care about. Um, now where you're kind of feeling there's some clarity and you've got hope for sure and you're motivated, like what would you tell somebody who's maybe a, not there yet what would, what would be your encouragement ah so you have to come to your end of yourself and you have to get to a point where you're willing to surrender your pride and for me pride was a big motivator in a lot of things i did and when i came to christ in a relationship with him i came in a homeless method and was recently started smoking heroin this and that like and i was i kind of admitted okay you know what like so I came in with a very open mind and I tried to put my pride of bay. And I came to realize like when you have a savior, when you develop a relationship with Christ, it involves, you can't say someone's your savior when you're still being full of pride and still doing this. When you come to that end of yourself and you realize how good the promises of the gospel are for me, that was the big one. Oh, I'm forgiven. Okay. I'll, I'll I'll deal with that. I like the sound of that. Oh, I'm a new creation through Christ. Oh, I have the Holy Spirit in me. It took me putting my pride away to actually think, oh, do I believe this? Do I accept it? But that was, I think, the big one for me is pride always got in the way of my sobriety. Oh, I'm not going to treatment. Oh, no. I'd always play the thing. I'd bawl and cry when I'm going down or relapsing. But then the second I'm sober, oh, I'm good. I'm good. Don't need it. But that was the big thing is you have to come and let that pride come to the end of yourself i know it's like a common thing is once you come to the end of yourself or hit your rock bottom but that's what it took for me was to finally get me into treatment and to submit to some things i really really did not want to submit to but you will see the fruit of that i from i was kind of scared when i left the treatment center because i didn't know hey am i still the same guy am i still when i got a thousand bucks in my pocket gonna blow it all on drugs and gambling and this but no, I've seen it now. Once you get that sobriety, the clarity, I can have money. I can set financial goals. I can, I the gamble, like I'd, I'd switch addictions. Yeah. So whenever I wouldn't be drinking or doing blow, I'd be gambling a thousand bucks a night. So it's even like I went to the casino. I've spent 20, like it's, it's a change of who you are. And I, that's for me when I started realizing, Hey, this is real. Like all the things that I did prior in my old life, they're gone. But it took like a huge, huge, huge adjustment that took a well, it took time and it took kind of just wanting that more than anything else for a long time. So good. I think the things we learn is to, uh, first of all, be nice to ourselves. And it's hard because I think, I think when we're working through, uh, if it's addictions or working through um, grief is another one and trauma and these different things like that. Uh, sometimes we're trying to measure up to somebody else's expectation of, of us. And then sometimes we're, we're pretty full of guilt and shame. 
uh, and some brokenness. And I think, you know, this whole journey of what I'm doing of stories across Canada um, is really about hearing people's stories and where they're at and their experiences. Um, and people are going to have different, they're going to be in different places at different times. And that's okay. Like I, I think, I think as a, as, as a society, we become better uh, as we learn to listen to stories. And, and I think sometimes we learn to listen to people's stories. Then we start to take a look at our stories. And, and, and I like what you said, Shooter, like we end up having this hope that I'm not stuck at the bottom of a well and life is meaningless. Life's important. Um, well, that's, it is if you have the right belief system. Like for me, I didn't, I didn't know yeah. anything bigger than myself. And I'll be completely honest. Myself was a pretty big failure and disappointment at the time. And if that's yeah. all, you know, like how can you have any hope or expectation that life's going to get better when all you have is the same repeated evidence that it's not. Yeah. So that for me is like the biggest thing about sobriety is having that higher power that for, for me, it's Christ. I yeah. believe truly in the, promises the what the gospel says like second corinthians 5 17 like you're i'm a new person i believe that so for me it's easy i could tell you all the sob stories all the shitty things i've done to people how many times i've let the world down how many drugs i could tell you all the bad stories but i really like christianity because when i came to christ that's the past now and i don't dwell in it like for me i really believe like you can sit there in your sob story and your depression till you die. And I've seen it. I've seen it in my family where they are freaking fixated on the things that happened to them in their childhood that they continue in their addiction to this day. Like, and that's what I really, it's, it was like a free get out jail card. Hey, you're forgiven. You know, you just do this. I'm like, okay. So I, I took that at face value and I refused to live in the past because I did for such a long time and it didn't get me anywhere. So one of the things I like about Shooter uh, before we sign off here is that um, in his experience of faith, it, it's not based on rules and regulations. It's actually based on a relationship. And again, I've known him for a while. And when I see him now, uh, and the way we're talking here now is the way we talk in the car. If we're having a coffee, it's just we're both pretty passionate and stuff. But it's real. It's genuine. And, and I think that's important because I know people, um, I talk to people all the time in different parts of life or faith or work or like I just know so many I'm pretty fortunate with so many people and I've learned to realize that because I may be at step A or B or C or D in different parts of my life I've learned to realize that um, I want to encourage people not to give up hope and uh, there's better days uh, I've had this last year I think close to 50 people pass away that I've known um, you know firsthand or through people I've known and how we deal with losing people and working through fear and all these different things is is hard uh, but again the whole idea of stories across Canada is learning from our stories and like Shooter said is is you know we don't need to be stuck in the back end of, of thinking our life will continue to be horrible because it once was uh, there's actually incredible hope and again the power of stories um, is I think it's pretty encouraging. So anyways, thank you, Shooter. Yeah. You were awesome. Thanks for sharing with me and no, sharing with us. Best of luck on your trip across Canada. Yeah, we will uh, keep everybody in touch. Thanks, and Bye. talk to you later. Bye. What was that? No, that's